Hi, welcome to the Literature Lounge, which is literally and totally dedicated to authors who write books that make great films and conversation starters. So let's just talk books. Hi, in today's episode, we have with us a truly remarkable guest, Sandeep Nulkar, as the first Asian to receive the outstanding contribution to the Language Industry Award and one of the top global. localization influences we are going to find out a little bit more sandeep has transformed the art of translation sandeep also contributes to several advisory boards and is presently the vice president of the alliance france pune he is a popular columnist author who is currently working on his first fiction novel and has been commissioned to write two film scripts so anybody who is looking to get their stories in can get in touch with sandeep nulkar i hope welcome sandeep in today's episode and your book is called a tongue in cheek look at how indian english can amuse and even confuse so what made you come up with this title <laughs> okay so uh, first of all thank you for having me on your show and uh, hello to all the viewers uh, well this uh, I, actually uh, the book is a culmination of a process that probably started back when i was in school uh, so i studied in a convent school and usually you know you're brought up on that staple uh, of praise that okay this guy can speak english or his english is better than someone else's and then uh, for the first time when i stepped out of india in the year 2000 i went to london that's where the, i got my first reality check that this seems a little different as in uh, it was not seen the kind of english we speak uh but it didn't really hit home until i went into a bookshop uh, and i actually found a dictionary there that said uh, english to american and that was kind of an eye opener because i said okay the british are unwilling to call american english even english they are calling it american so by that logic probably we speak indian and not english so to say so that's how this journey started mind it of course uh, is uh, something that's very popular uh, as a phrase uh, and it's just something that uh, i thought would go well with the whole concept of uh, you know talking about indian languages in a lighter uh, lighter way so to say yeah so you can tell us a little bit about your journey what inspired you to enter the translation industry you know and what keeps you motivated after all these years so uh, i kind of uh, didn't plan to get into the industry this again happened by chance because it was a series of events so back in the day when we were growing up uh, mostly everyone had a bajaj scooter Mm-hmm. yes of, and not it was an old scooter that was handed down to you by some uncle or someone it never worked you always had to be uh, a very hands on mechanic so i kind of knew the functioning of a bajaj two wheeler uh, i could probably even do a little bit of servicing myself so that was the base knowledge that i had going to college i studied french then post graduation i did in international business and my summer training as luck would have it was in bajaj auto where i was day one i was asked to translate a lot of content from french into english english into french and it all happened to be in a field that i was very familiar with and so even after my internship ended that relationship kind of uh, had begun and that probably was a very natural progression uh, and that's how i got into the field and obviously it helped uh that uh, you know being in pune pune being such a major center for automobile auto ancillary and other industries uh the demand was picking up uh because it was the early 90s our economy had opened up so i think things just fell into place and there was no real plan as such it just happened but i loved uh, every thing i was doing right from uh, day one so there was never really a reason to look for something else so what is the pathway or challenges that you had to you know go through to be the first asian to receive the outstanding contribution to the language industry award i had not heard about it till i 
uh, you know, uh, started reading your bio and I was so impressed because it's so it's so important for this sort of work to be recognized. So but I'm sure it has not been easy. So what were the challenges that you faced? So very honestly, even I wasn't aware of this award until I got it, although it's a very popular award on the European circuit. Okay. Uh, and uh, like like everyone, you just go about doing your work, you go about doing your work religiously, you enjoy your work and awards usually are just uh, something that happen uh, by the by. And uh, I think somewhere uh, the focus was on India. The focus was on India also because uh, of the kind of market we are, on the kind of languages that uh, people really need to deal with if they have to enter the Indian market. And at that point, I seem to be uh, one of the only voices coming out of India. So the focus already was on me in that sense, uh, probably it made it easier for people to understand what I was doing. And uh, that's probably one of the major reasons why uh, that recognition eventually uh, came my way. So let's just talk a little bit about uh, the inspiration behind Mind It and let's explore the quirks, you know, of Indian English. Tell me one or two. I mean, there are some very funny ones that uh, yeah. we used to say while we were in Delhi, what goes to your father, which means that Tera Baap Ka Kya. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and people understood that yeah. the other thing that my mother used to say a1 i don't know what uh, you know rating is that but mm -hmm. for any dish that she's done very well she would say it is a1 so yeah. uh, you know so just just tell me some of the quirks of the indian uh, english so i think uh, there are more quirks in indian english if you compare it to uh, the british uh, version of english uh, but Viewed from our perspective, we are doing just fine. As in, if the idea of uh, a language is to help people communicate, then I think we do it wonderfully well uh, using whatever way, uh, ways, you know, we can think of to reach out to someone. And it's strange because uh, English happens to be the only language that can bind to Indians who do not speak the same language. The same, yeah. So it's True. in that sense also something that helps us connect. So we don't really pay too much attention to grammar or correctness. And I'm really not a purist. Uh, and even the book is a very uh, lighthearted kind of look at how we speak. It's the ability to laugh at yourself rather than, you know, uh, be a, a grammar Nazi or something and say that, okay, this is wrong and one shouldn't speak like that. I, I think I, I get a lot of uh, sadistic pleasure in what we have done to the English language after what the British have done to us. So I think that's a little payback, uh, so to say that uh, we can look at it. <laughs> yeah. I like this payback. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so. it is a like it is like a payback, I think, for the atrocities that they committed in our country. Why not? No, I think language is where it hurt, where it hurts the most. Uh, yes. So I think that's what we have played around with the most. and. <laughs> That's a source of uh, sadistic pleasure sometimes. <laughs> but yeah, uh, there are, of course, a couple uh, of uh, Indianisms, so to say, uh, that stand out. And those also probably personal favorites. One of them is uh, pressurize someone. We say that you don't to pressurize someone. So you can't pressurize someone, you can pressure someone, you can put pressure on someone, but you can't really pressurize someone. So uh, that's, of course, one. And then on the phone, a lot of people end up saying Sandeep this side or something like that. Uh, so that's a little uh, funny uh, to me. I, it always brings a smile to my face. When, yes, so, even in Delhi, when they'll have to ask for directions, they'll say, you know, go go into this lane and then at the back side is the house. Yeah, back <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, these are the Indian English quirks. But tell me, let's get a little political. What are your thoughts on the current state of multi, uh, you know, lingualism that's going on in India? And there's so much. There was, uh, you know, these hoardings that were broken down in Karnataka and elsewhere also. So there is this pride, you know, in your own language and uh, uh, which makes sense. But yet we know that India is united with one common language. It's difficult to learn all the languages. Tell me what steps can we take to promote, uh, you know, this further? I think uh, 
the problem is fairly simple and we have kind of complicated it it's about understanding your limits as a guest uh, you might not be a guest in another state because it's still your country but in that sense you're still a guest of that culture so if i were to come and live in your house there is a certain set of unwritten rules that i would follow and uh, one of the first things that anyone who really loves languages would do and i have done this all my life i can't stay in a place for more than few a few days uh, without really trying to understand the script and or try to pick up a few words here and there so i can read and write uh, punjabi i can read and write kannada thereby a little bit of telugu gujarati uh, even when i i stayed in dubai for a little uh, longer on a holiday i started learning to read and write arabic so it's just that natural interest you know that you show in the local culture and when that does not happen and the ratio starts getting skewed uh, when you start speaking in hindi or english as a common language in a state where neither hindi nor english have really any place that's why i think the linguistic pride starts coming up so i think it's more to do with how we do not adopt or uh, integrate well into a culture which is why these kind of things happen but i think it would be really interesting and that's what happened to me long long ago when we started our office in uh, bangalore like after 10 days i started learning to you know read and write kannada and it took not more than 7 days it's it's not really rocket science all indian languages are extremely easy to read and write uh, you just need to understand the logic uh, how the language functions and trust me that's the first time in my life i really understood the meaning of feeling empowered because uh, until then i was a stranger to the city the day i could read and write and interestingly my uh, reference points are like ko fucking fisher it's not ko for some purest word it's everything like ko for kfc because that's what was bilingual and it helped so uh, but then the city really welcomes you and uh, you can read everything you don't feel lost uh, go a step ahead you can uh, speak a few words as an i can uh, get myself to any place uh, in a cab in bangalore speaking basic kannada and that really makes you feel very different so i think uh, all uh, the problems that uh, really uh, are happening because of the language probably can be solved if each one of us so shows a little interest and i take a little more interest in uh, the people staying in your family of course you'll like it so it's just that willingness to go that extra mile what are the common misconceptions about indian english you know that you aim to dispel through your book i haven't really tried to dispel anything through the book that's honestly like i said i don't know how many people believe that but i really believe that indians can laugh at themselves like no one else does yeah we, yeah. we uh, do uh, you know have uh, that quality if i may say so uh, yes we do without really trying to be preachy without trying to you know telling people to change anything Uh, i have just said that okay this is what we do isn't that funny so that that was the only intention so there are no misconceptions or myths or anything that i am trying to bust or anything that i am trying to change honestly so that was the intention let's just have fun understanding and noticing uh, what we say why we say it and then just dig a little deeper and understand uh, the reasons and if at all someone really wants to know कि अरे भाई आपने कह तो दिया ये गलत है बट देन व्हाट इज द राइट थिंग सो दैट्स हाउ दैट आल्सो हैज फाउंड प्लेस इन द बुक सो डू यू थिंक इंडियनिज्म्स यू नो आर अ रिफ्लेक्शन ऑफ इंडियाज डाइवर्स कल्चरल डाइवर्सिटी एंड इफ सो हाउ दे मोस्ट डेफिनेटली आर वी काइंड ऑफ ड्रॉ पैरेलल्स फ्रॉम द लैंग्वेजेस वी स्पीक करेक्ट we say little little for example yeah we do <laughs> uh, so that urge to you know it never in your head it will never seem sufficient if you don't say that little one more time it will almost give you that feeling ki kuch adhura reh gaya to little little uh, no doubt yeah so that's coming from uh, your own mother tongue that's coming from your own mother tongue the 
sometimes our pronunciations and you'll have uh, maharashtrians speak english in a certain way bengalis speak english in a certain way so uh, the accents will come into uh, the picture yeah. the grammar yeah. will come into the picture so i think definitely it does uh, uh, it, it is influenced by our own languages and cultures also so you know tell me when you went into london did you face any criticism you know for the indian uh, english that probably dilutes the purity of the language not really because i think they kind of get what you're saying they're just amused sometimes as to how differently we speak otherwise uh, it's not so difficult to understand uh, i still would like to believe that our accent is one of the better accents uh, if you compare it to so many other nationalities and the yes. kind of uh, roughness or yeah. whatever you know they have in yeah. their accent so there wasn't really uh, any of that happening but it was very interesting for me to especially uh, see the difference and kind of that it just became uh, something i invariably ended up doing that would i have said something like this uh, when you hear someone Uh, speak very differently so can you share any insights into the fiction novel you're currently working on and what themes are you exploring uh, the one that i'm currently working on is to do with patriarchy and uh, that's the base of it but i think it talks about marriage as an institution and okay. how that needs to be reformed and probably we need uh, an alternative so to say uh, because the number of marriages that you look around you and it's not only in uh, urban areas it's also in rural areas it's just that uh, in rural areas people don't have that kind of a voice yet and which is why they look a lot more stable but i think the premise of the marriage itself is what i'm questioning and the idea is to write a story and interesting story uh, some of it inspired by uh, actual uh, real incidents that might have happened uh, and present an alternative to people that you can do it this way too because uh, i think a lot of things don't happen the way they should so yeah. to give you an example uh, we would normally have a particular time uh, at which we eat lunch or dinner or whatever you know but no one really questions whether you're hungry and no one really skips a meal and if you do you still feel like okay but i think it was time to eat and i didn't eat and Correct. you extrapolate that to a marriage situation and you say okay i want to get married because abhi shaadi ki umar ho gayi but have i met the right person and uh, if i don't meet the right person what if i don't get married at all so uh there are many layers of course to this and that's what will hopefully come out uh through the book. I'll be the first person to buy the book <laughs> so you've been commissioned to write two film scripts how does writing for film differ from your other writing experiences well that's one uh, area where i feel very uncomfortable in a good way because uh, it's a very different thing to write a story screenplay and dialogues for something uh, that is really not part of the real world so even a even if it's a fiction novel so to say uh, you are still creating that reality but here there are so many more factors that are going to uh, come into the picture because you might write a story it looks absurd but when you put it out there on screen uh, it will just look perfect people won't even question it yes uh, so in that sense uh, the lines between what really can be written how much to push a character a story a character's arc uh, all those things are very different uh, from what i have probably written until now so even the novel is a lot more realistic the script uh, probably isn't uh, realistic it's not something that can happen in our lives in your opinion what are the most significant misconceptions about the translation industry that you know to this podcast you wish to address for now as in i would have probably given a different answer some years ago uh, today the greatest misconception is that the translation industry even exists so i don't think the industry exists now the translation industry has been probably already replaced by what i would safely call a post editing industry 
so machine translations would probably always be uh, wherever possible the first uh, option and a lot of uh, people who need to translate uh, probably are even doing it themselves using whatever tools they have access to uh, if they feel a little scared they will go to a professional uh, when possible they will still say that you know uh, we don't mind if you use a uh, machine translation but then you can please uh, ensure that you edit it well and it's still up to the mark that helps them uh, get what they want faster and cheaper and i think uh, a lot of people who want to come into this profession uh, probably have missed this part out they don't want to be a part of the translation industry they want to be a part of the post editing industry and uh, the kind and quality of content uh, that good machine translation engines are producing is mind boggling especially in the last 4 to 5 years uh, we'll still need humans to edit it mm-hmm. but what it means is that uh, the entry barrier now uh, has been set so high that most people will be ruled out unless you are not only bilingually an expert but you're also a uh, kind of an expert of the domain or at least have the ability to you know acquire the necessary knowledge in a particular domain so do you think globalization will affect cultural identity and linguistic diversity in the future you know in the years ahead i think it already has as in uh, if you go to all major cities they pretty much look the same as in yeah they do have malls you'll still have kfc's and burger kings and what not you know so i i remember even 15 odd years ago you go to goa uh, you could hear people speak konkani there were still uh, those very quaint little uh, restaurants run by families and now it's you can uh, eat punjabi you can eat chinese so goa is lost and uh, so is the local language as in at least as tourists uh, it's become that much more difficult for you to get to hear people speak konkani which was probably the norm 15 or 20 years ago so uh, it has uh, fortunately for india uh, as they say uh, most of india resides in villages which is where this is still untrue so i think all the globalization has really not touched uh, our villages and i am really glad that's the case as in pers- question of perspective whether Uh, they are missing out on something or have we gone too far how do you see the role of technology particularly ai evolving in the translation industry are there any risks associated with this advancement you know we are all scared about ai you know very few of us understand it also fully but we know that a lot of jobs are going to get uh, taken over and uh, apparently the work that they do is excellent so you know for writers like you writers like me columnists we want to get our translations done so how much do you think uh, you know this would affect our work personally feel that you should as a professional you should have the ability to use whatever technology you have at your disposal to improve the output and honestly that's been the case ever since as in i started working at a time when there were lathe machines on shop floors uh when they were going to be replaced by cnc machines there was a un cry that okay this is going to take away jobs of course jobs were lost but even today the jobs that are being lost at times they will be lost because the person who is actually delivering a service is not as good as they need to be in the first place so i think anyone who's good and I- i'm saying this uh, in even a very creative way if you have something like a chat gpt i look at chat gpt not as a threat like not as some uh, application that's going to write instead of me i am just thinking of it as a great friend i just have one friend and that friend knows it all and i am just chatting with that friend that's it that's it it makes my research easier a lot of things easy the creativity is still mine you just you you want to think of 50 names for a character and it's a very benign uh, kind of a situation there is there's not no rocket science there but i will ask you i will ask myself i will ask 50 friends i just ask chat gpt it gives me 50 options and i end up using ne- neither of them i will just combine some two of them and come up with a name and that just works well 
so i think uh, the art of using technology instead of uh, you know being scared of it and every professional today in the country i think the first thing that we need to do is step up and learn and be more capable uh, so what do you hope that the readers will take away from mind it about the nature of language and communication i think the depth is what is missing uh, today uh, when we talk about languages and there's a very beautiful concept my maushi something that you say in maharashtra my maushi my is mother maushi is mother sister masi so uh, i think if your mother tongue is your m- mother then all other languages are your masis all other indian languages are your masis so that's how we st- need to start looking at it okay uh, this book like i said what does the reader take away i think if it brings a smile to their face not the haha kind of a smile but a tongue in cheek one uh, it serves its purpose uh, i think if you read some chapters of the book what will probably come through is the depth each chapter has in terms of grammar usage and the entire etymology so to say of the indianism and that is the depth that we need to aspire to have in our own languages so i always tell people that your mother tongue you should be able to speak read write your mother tongue as well as your grandparents not as your parents even the parent generation has lost a lot because if we don't keep our own languages alive we are going to lose a lot of our culture and i'll give you an example uh, if i ask you to translate uh, something like tgif thank god it's friday you will not be able to translate something like this in any of the indian languages it's just not our culture to let our hair down on a friday a weekend uh, even most indian languages will not have a very good parallel for weekend which is such a common word in urban life uh, because a weekend need not be any different from any other day so i think Uh, there there was a time when i was invited to speak somewhere and people were talking about how you know uh, the influence and in children and they were worried about their children i said if you want to protect your children make sure they don't learn english at all at all because there are a lot of things they will never know if you don't learn french you will never be exposed to the idea of wine i am not saying protect everyone from everything but i am saying that's the kind of power uh, a language has that's the kind of culture that is always uh, hidden within the layers of every language and which is why it's up to us to ensure that we do speak our language or that we use our language and that we always strive uh, to make sure that it's at least as good as our grandparents wonderful wonderful sandeep thank you so much and i stand guilty here for uh, it's taken me very long now to embrace my own mother tongue i think i come from uh, you know aspirational middle class uh, bengali home where they put me into an english school where second language is bangla and you know you dread it because the grammar is so tough and uh, you know i embraced english and uh, um, unfortunately my son has not learned bangla to read and write i do um, my writing is very weak but then reading i can because i've started reading it a lot more than what i did when i was young and uh, so thank you so much and uh, once again the book name is mind it a tongue in cheek look at how indian english can amuse and even confuse this was sandeep nulkar thank you so much for being on today's episode thank you thank you ma'am thank you so thank much. you thank you for tuning into the literature lounge which is an all year round literature festival dedicated to writers across the globe you can get in touch with us via linkedin or dm us at our instagram page the mohua show or you can also email us at hello at the rate the mohua show.com to discuss your books and also meet authors you haven't yet met at the literature lounge